Funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. If you're not exactly looking for it, the chances are good that you'll drive right past it. This small Texas town, 60 miles east of San Antonio, was once a thriving oil town. Luling, Texas, also the home of Charlie Fitch and Sarge Records. Don't you say no, sir, while we dance along I'll hold you tightly and hug so lightly The tickle toe song The rhythm is beating, our hearts are repeating No, no, it can't be wrong Let yourself go, then you will know The meaning of the tickle toe song The Luling phonograph and record shop looks nothing like it did 50 years ago. A quick glance through the storefront window would leave you with the impression that the store must have been abandoned long ago. But as anyone who visits the store today knows, Charlie Fitch has single-handedly ensured that at least a portion of the music of South Texas would be preserved, and the musicians themselves remembered. Somebody had written some songs or something. Wanted to get a place to uh, record him. So I called Mercury Records in Chicago. And then I called Capitol, and they never answered my call. So I just said I'd do it myself. fascinated by the kudos that Charlie is receiving now at this stage of his life and his career. And when people come over here from Europe and Germany and Holland and the Netherlands and I think even Japan, to meet Charlie Fish and see these great no Sarge records and they're just going crazy over it. So they're coming over here in droves and <laughs> Charlie's shows me some pretty nice checks from these people, you know, because some of these records he sells are worth a lot more now than they were then, especially to these collectors and people like that. Around here, they know you as the uh, VA officer. Dad was a VA officer here, and he helped a lot of uh, people here Veterans. that were retired to get their pensions. So that was what he was known around here for, that and the record shop man. I just wish more people realized what he's done. Lots of times people, when they try to achieve something in their own hometown, they just don't take uh, enough notice. Now, people that are involved in, in the country and western music, uh, they know who he is, and they... Uh, are very proud of it, and some don't even pay any attention to it. They just go their merry way. I guess that's with life. Don't make me lead, baby. You, you know take your own people for granted. Oh, there's that guy walking down the street. Yeah, didn't he make some records or something? When, and, and these are people that live in Luling or his own hometown when they're coming from Germany and all these other places to meet Charlie Fitch and buy his records. You know, Luling at the time, I'm not sure very many people knew anything about Sarge Records. It was even a shock to us as young kids when we found out the people that were under his label or um, even went to the shop all the time. I mean, I'm just astounded. I mean, 
so many of them are the Country Hall of Fame now. I think Sarge sort of existed in its own world. I think they never really had a shot outside their area. And I think it's to their credit that they did so much. Because I'm sure it was hard. You know, I'm sure there were times when they weren't selling records. But just if you look at the volume of what they put out and the, and the diversity of it, and I really think that it was probably Charlie Finch's true love of music that made him do it. I was one of these lousy kids running around, and, and I thank my God every day that, that narcotics wasn't as wide open then as they are now, or I'd have been hooked. Because those were the days. I worked for my meals, and uh, I would go to a, like a cafeteria and, and do two hours washing dishes or whatever to get two meals for that day. And uh, I just got disgusted living like that, and I went to the recruiting office and said, I do. I used my business college education to get a paper job, and I went to Puerto Rico and stayed two and a half years. But then I got to thinking, what did you do, Dad, during the war? I didn't want to say I was sitting in Puerto Rico drinking Cuba Libras, so I wanted to get into it, but sometimes after I got into it, I wished I was back drinking Cuba Libras because it got pretty hot. I wanted to be a pilot. I came back and didn't do too good at flying training. So I wound up as a tail gunner. You don't get credit for a mission unless you drop your bombs. So we, we dropped our bombs about the same time we were hitting number two engine. Then we got the order to, to bail out. And being the oldest on the crew, held the door open while the rest of them jumped. I was getting ready to land and there was a bunch of German civilians down there waiting for me. So for the next six months, I was their guest. Charlie was a POW in World War II. Came down into a tree, and the Germans were there waiting for him. Put us on a train, carried us to an interrogation center where we interrogated, and they sent me up to key fighting, which was Stalag 4. Foggers, one, two, three, four. A, B, C, D. I was in this one. It was built for, what is it, 12 men, I think. There was 18 in there. He slept on the floor. How do you think the military experience uh, affected the way you ran your business? It had no effect on running it. You're not going to use the same, uh, let's say, authority out here as you do in the military. Because the, uh, they'll do a 160 and they're gone. If this is, what you want to do is make a customer out of them. Uh, that damn sergeant don't give a damn whether you like him or not. After I re-enlisted, I got 90 days re-enlistment leave, and I got 60 days POW leave. So six months, didn't do nothing but collect my pay. After I enlisted, and I went around town here, and I saw these people having the jukeboxes. They were getting them from Seguin, see the next town over here. And I thought, well, heck, why don't they have jukeboxes here and let somebody local put his money in the bank and <coughs> here instead of the money going out of town. So I'd pick up one at a time here and there, you know. But my reenlistment bonus I used to buy my first jukebox. I didn't have this place when I started out in jukeboxes. I started out at my mother's house, but I didn't have a house or nothing here. My wife and I drove back and forth. Come in on the weekend, go back, 
did that for four years. And then we started to get tired of it and the service changed and you know. And so in 1950, I said, I'm getting out and moving home, moving to Luling, see, so moved back here. And then uh, mother had this building, bought this building and had an apartment in the back. That was convenient, living in the back. I'd get up and go out on a route, go to San Antonio by, bring them in and take my route records, type them up and everything, put her stock out and my wife would get up and fix the breakfast and then she'd go up to the open store up and sell records. This is my store. This is my records. His records is to sell to the public if they want them. I didn't come tax records. It's a different record, I mean. <laughs> and this is the the workshop where I keep my stock that I work on the route, route of jukeboxes. Someday you may have the same thing happen. You know how I feel. And this is the apartment that we lived in for, oh, I don't know how many years. I think the music of South Texas, there are so many influences and it's so broad that there isn't one sound. You know, one label might specialize in a certain thing like a real hard country sound or a blues sound or you know, straight rock and roll sound, but there, there's really no one identifiable thing where you could go like, that's the South Texas sound. There's no sound that, that ties us all together. There's an attitude that ties us all together and that attitude is born out of the fact that the music is played in honky tonks and dance halls. And the kind of music that you play in honky tonk and dance halls is different than the kind of music you play in concert halls. So I think that's what unites Texas musicians in the in the present and uh, and day and and in the past is that we we have a great tradition of, of in Texas of, of of beer drinking and dancing, dancing more more importantly maybe than beer drinking. In the 1830s or so, uh, we had a lot of immigrants from Germany and Ireland. Uh, and they took with them from the old country, they brought over instruments like the violin and the uh, accordion. Country music evolved in the 20s and 30s. Country swing had a genesis in jazz. It was a, a mixture of jazz and blues. Western swing is a term that has been coined over the last, I guess, 50 years to describe the music that was developed in Southwest uh, through string bands playing swing music. There's a lot of basis in the blues, Dixieland, and big band swing music. And the big difference is, of course, that they, that they had strings doing this. Fiddles, guitars, steel guitars. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of regional records on several hundreds of labels. Charlie just happened to have a good record label because he had such good taste getting a uh, a lot of the, these people that couldn't get record deals elsewhere, but it actually got the tracks laid down. Charlie Fitch, uh, who'd gotten back from the service, Sergeant Fitch, started a record company called Sarge. The way that he started his label is somebody came to him and said, hey, I can't get my record out. And then he was trying to shop it with another record company, and they weren't interested, and then he goes, what, what the heck? And they said, well, what are you going to name it? Well, what did they call you in the service? Charge. A lot of the bands came to him when they wanted a record out, and it was easy for him to, to get, it, get it out, and he kept his label going at the time. I uh, went and did a uh, recording in the studio. I used some of the same guys that uh, George Jones used in the 
studio musicians at that time and uh, did a song called Looking for Money. Staggering Willie down on his knees Looking for something down in the leaves Of Joe Ruby in a big black car Staggering Willie, what you looking for? I'm looking for money I'm looking for money I'm looking for money But I can't find none nowhere That was just before the time that uh, rock and roll started coming out. I wanted something kind of silly. You know, because everybody wanted Moon and June and Spoon songs, you know. And so I just threw that together just for the heck of it. Yeah. And it turned out to be, you know, the one that everybody liked. You didn't have to go out and look, but they come to you. They want to get on record, I got this song I wrote. I'd like for you to hear it, whether I say yes or no, and it's the story they're singing it. So uh, I've had audition right there on the floor where you are. I never called uh, Charlie Fitch, the owner, or anything, but one weekend, I got my old flipper and took my $10 guitar and went to Sarge Records in Luling, Texas. And I walked in uh, to the record shop, so I said, well, I'm Jeff Stone from San Antonio, and I'm a singer, and I'm good. And Charlie laughed. And when I think back today, that I've gotten a little older and I hope a little wiser. I don't really blame him for laughing, you know, with a kid coming up talking like that. And he said, you have a lot of nerve. He said, uh, what do you have? So I had a bag of songs and I got the old guitar and sang some songs to him. He uh, listened, he was nice. And he said, I like two of those. Let's record them on storage. He did for us exactly what we had in mind. Our idea of recording on, on Sarge was to help get us known and help our dance jobs in, in the area. And we did, we did just, just that. My record company was a audition because I could not handle a national release. Uh, I couldn't manufacture them and ship them and because I didn't have the funds to do it with. So by making an audition label like this, the guys would come in and they want to make a record. And if it got a little airplay, well then RCA or Columbia wanted to pick him up. Fine. The audition worked. If I ever needed you, I need you now. Charlie and I never had a contract. He just asked me to make some records with him. And, uh, and I did. And I remember telling him real plain that I'd sing them for him frontwards or backwards or upside down. It didn't make any difference. Just so he'd uh, put me on record. That was fine with me. Some of these bring back fond memories. I don't know what to do. He'd done a lot for the local musicians, and he cut a lot of the bands that would have never gotten uh, to Nashville. You had to go to Nashville in order to, to uh, get a, a recording contract with RCA or Columbia or whatever. When we set out and started making records, we didn't expect a national hit. We had the intent to just uh, try to be better known in this area where we had our, our dance bands. But Charlie had connections and distribution. He could have gone bigger. I had written some songs and thought, you know, these aren't bad. I went down there and I said, Mr. Fitch, why don't you listen to some songs? He said, I tell you what, let's do it, Clyde. I said, why don't you get your two or three members together and get some of the older boys who've got a really country western band. Y'all sort of get together and practice a little bit, call me, and I'll come listen to him. That's what we did. We had no intentions of, of starting a band. We'd written a few songs and, and played a few of them on our jobs, on our gigs here in Yonder. And he heard several of them and asked if we'd come down and record them for Swords. And that's how I got started with, with uh, Charlie Fish. He never did think I was good enough because he, <laughs> he used to have a lot of jukeboxes around the country. And I was playing around these little honky-tonks. And I'd go into a place to put a poster up or something. He'd be in there changing the record on his jukebox. And I'd look over at him. I'd say, 
Well, when you think I'm ready, Charlie, and he said, I'll let you know. So <laughs> when I got a song together that I thought would go, I come in and he heard it, so he recorded it. Walking Fever was my first one, wasn't it, Charles? 1958. He's put a lot of money into these uh, records that he's put out on these uh, local and regional artists over the years. And although maybe a few of them wanted to, more than Charlie had to give, Charlie was always always ready to give what he could. And, and it's one of the things I appreciate him, about him, his, his honesty. Charlie would usually let us do just about what we wanted to as far as recording. And uh, we learned real quick that whatever Charlie said he would do, that's the way it would be. And uh, we didn't have to worry about his part of the bargain. He put his money where his mouth was, so to speak. He, he went out and, and uh, if he saw an artist or heard an artist that he liked, Charlie would pay for it. He would take him in the studio and, and put a record out on him and see what it would do. I tried to follow the trend with country and western, and it went into rockabilly. And then uh, some black boys came in and just make some rock and roll, rhythm and blues. Okay, I tried black. I tried recording Mexican music, everything, just to see if I could do it, and, and it worked out pretty good. All the local bands, and artists that wanted to be famous, and Dad had such a good, good big heart. He wanted to help them out, and uh, he didn't care about if he made any money or not, he just wanted to help them. He just gave a lot of small town people and people that couldn't get to Nashville at the time, he gave them a chance to get started. And, uh, and it was exciting being part of that. One day I was, in, <laughs> I was in Charlie's office at his record shop and we were talking about Willie Nelson. He said, did you know that Willie Nelson auditioned for my record label? He wanted to get on my record label one time. He sent a tape to Charlie trying to get on Sarge Records. I woke up this morning and I looked out my door. I can tell my milk cow. I can tell my whiskey. So I said, Charlie, I've got to hear this record or this tape. And he said, well, I still have it because he saves everything. Pulled out that old tape and played it for me, and I'll tell you, it just blew me away. So I asked him to please let me have a copy of it. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll let you have a copy of this and let nobody else have one. Because there's only one in existence, now there's going to be two in existence, you see. And on the audition, Willie says, Charlie, you probably don't remember me. I work down here at KBOP in Pleasanton, and I happen to have an hour off. And I thought I'd send you a couple of songs I wrote. I cut a session with Dave Isabel uh, down at uh, ACA in Houston. I believe it was uh, on a Sarge label and it was released. I talked to you about a recording contract and I was supposed to send a tape over, but uh, I never got around to it until now. Got a few minutes off. I thought I'd uh, put a couple of them down on tape and let you listen to them, see what you thought about them. First one, when I was sung my last hillbilly song, it was about five or six years old. He was a disc talk and I asked him to uh, send me an audition tape and he sent it and I put it on record but one day I had the tape, put it on top of my car and I re forgot it, driving down the street, phew, it blew away and I have never found it but I've got a record recording of what was on the tape. He was auditioning for me. I kept it 20 years, and after he uh, after he became a big hit, and I figured, well, that would be a good collector's item. There's a lot of legendary records on Sarge, but mainly known by collectors only. I mean, these were not people that went on to become the Elvis Presley's and Buddy Holly's of the world. The sound quality is excellent. I mean, I'll put it up against, uh, you know, some of the mass-produced stuff. But 
the sound that I'm looking for is the Western swing, Texas, Texas swing type sound. And yeah, a lot of that stuff I think holds up to uh, what some of the major artists were doing. A lot of stuff, a lot of stuff doesn't, but I, th I think as Charlie describes in his book there, a lot of that was a talent label, trying to get people started, like a look and see kind of thing, just try them out. Very good label, Sarge, though. I don't know much about it, but Chicago, I always heard it's a good label, and it tells you right here it's good, you know. His dad doesn't really advertise anymore anything. They don't know that he still has some of his music available, so that he thought it was just like gone. So that makes it even more rare. <laughs> Did it say in the book what some of the records were oh, worth? Oh yeah, some of them were worth, you know, hundred dollars for a single, and uh, some of Al Urban's music was is worth a lot of money because they there's just well, it's you know that's he's the only place you can get it at. Adolf Hoffner was uh, one in a million. Uh, he never met a stranger in his life. He had a smile for everyone. And when uh, they took an intermission, Adolf immediately walked off the bandstand and shook hands with every person in the hall. He never met a stranger. Uh, you could ask him to play a song or say, how you doing, or well, let's go jump out of that tree, and he was with you, you know, whatever. Whatever, uh, whatever you wanted. I danced with an angel One night beneath the stars While cowboys were singing And playing guitar He played to the very large Bohemian Czechoslovakian Eastern European community that is one of the mainstays of Central Texas. There was polkas, you know, and, and shadishes and, and and those kind of things, which were the Eastern European dances that they brought with them to Texas. And the bands just sort of adapted. So Adolf was kind of like this uh, Western swing Bohemian band. You know, they do a lot of polkas, but they also did Western swing and in the mood and the and, and fiddle tunes and this that, and the other. He never was Elvis Presley or George Jones, but uh, when he went to South Texas and played a country dance, people were there, they loved him. He's one of the great treasures of Texas music. I think in a lot of ways he was Sarge Records. He was the one stable guy through it all, and uh, he was an amazing person, an amazing person. thing I could say about little Doug was I heard him at the barn in San Antonio and uh, I arranged with him to see if we can't cut a record by him. But there's only one hitch to using a youngster on a record is they'll draw a crowd when they can see them but they're just another voice on a record. My dad was, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, definitely a, a child prodigy. He uh, started playing music when he was, oh, I'd say in the five or six year old range. Uh, he played fiddle, uh, steel, he played mandolin, and uh, he grew up in a household that was very supportive of his musical endeavors. His mother and daddy used to uh, go around to the clubs on weekends and uh, 
And he wasn't but about five or six years old. But he was good. So I featured him on the steel guitar and let him do his own numbers and everything. And they'd pass the hat. And the little sucker made more money than I did. Doug Psalm, there's a guy that could roll with the punches. Whatever was in vogue, he could switch. And I mean, he'd be an expert at it. You know, I don't care if it was the English sound or country western or rock and roll, you name it, he could play it. If you said, like, what's so great about Texas music, you could point to Doug and go, like, just listen to this guy, because he can not only do it all, but he does it all great. And that, that's just, that started at Sarge. Without that, who knows what Doug would have done. He might have quit. If you look up in the dictionary, what's Texas music, there should be a picture of Doug Somm there. He started out as little Doug Somm, a steel guitar, western swing whiz, and later had gigantic rock and roll hits with She's About a Mover and Mendocino and many others. I can't say enough great things about Doug. I think that he is uh, the granddaddy of, uh, of modern, Texas music. I, I think the thing that gravitated other musicians towards my dad was the sincerity. You know how people are always looking for things that are real and you know the one thing about Doug Somm is the music was real. I mean what he did was straight from the heart he believed in everything that he did. She was walking down the street looking fat as she could be I always called him the state musician. And I, I don't know if we'll ever be able to replace him as that, but in a way we don't need to because his records are still around. But to think that all of that started at Sarge is, is like, man, they should just give them a plaque, you know? Birthplace of Little Doug. Won't you tell me why you left me high and dry? Won't you tell me why you made me blue? Won't you tell me why? You left me high and dry Cause I'm still in love with you At my record, I Need You Now, took off so fast. When Charlie released that thing, it, boom, went straight to the top, you know, around this part of the country. It was re really a great record for the time. If Charlie would maybe have shopped that to a, a, a big label or uh, had a real good distribution deal, uh, we could have had a real, real big record on that record, I think. But uh, Charlie kind of handled it himself and still did real well with it, but not near what he could have done if he'd have had, uh, like you say, better distribution deal. I'm having a hillbilly love affair. From that day forward, it changed my whole life. It was a lot of difference between having records and not having any. You know, all of a sudden the girls started looking a little closer and and the jobs got better. And so that actually started my career. And, and uh, we had, we've released a record since then, uh, about three a year, all my life. Please, please, I'm so lonesome. Any love you can give me will do. Larry Nolan was a Hank Thompson echo. I told him, I said, I'll give, give you a recording if you cut out to Hank Thompson and do some original voice. But he, but he, all the way, he'll mush a note like Hank. Oh. I never got that big monster record that put me over the top like, uh, say, Hank Thompson's Wild Side of Life. Uh, but I consider myself very lucky. I may not have reached that. That song went over that top mountain, but I, you can only do so many things and have so much fun, and I had all I needed to. Had me a Greyhound bus and a great band, and, and I'm not sorry for a day I ever did. Charlie Fitch used to fuss at me, said, Cecil, said, I'm going to tell you what, said, you can't be no barber or a gas jockey and make it big in the music business. And I grinned at him. He was serious and I agreed with him. If I would have put everything into it like Al Irvin did when he started, I would have been a whole lot better off probably. I may have been dead by now. As far as Cecil goes, he's, one thing I can say about this, 
He's been the same ever since I've ever known him. And, and it, you, it's never changed. You, you know, one thing too, you can hand him a guitar and tell him what, what you want to play and he can play it. If he's ever heard it, he can play it. It seems to me that a lot of people in the music business are shy, but they don't shine until they get on the stage. And I think that's the way it was with Cecil Moore. And Cecil, these days, when I see him, he's, he's a very humble fellow, but he's proud of, uh, of the notoriety that he's getting now through the, the recent compilation of the Sarge records over the years, and the stories on the various artists that Charlie Fitch has recorded over the years. And uh, that's, uh, that's very admirable, I think, in Cecil. Cecil got a chance to go to Nashville. Uh-uh, I don't want to go. Now, if it had been for overnight engagement, yeah. But th some people wanted him to go because the guitar and the voice, vocal, too. They could use him in Nashville, but he didn't want to leave home. Anybody come from looting and go to a big place like that, if I'd have had to open my mouth and sing a song, I'd have been in trouble. Well, I met a little gal about a week ago. Asked her to go steady, and what do you know? She took me up, but now she's gone. Where could my little baby be? I lost <laughs> the music. What's not, what instead <laughs> of that of yours, where they use it on national TV? On the on uh, Conan O'Brien. Conan O'Brien. Gotta go. I get a royalty check every three months on it. Charlie does too. In a western band, country band, it's been about 20, two or three years. So I'm nervous. If I had a wristwatch on, I'd either run it backwards hour or forwards hour. I'm so nervous. <laughs> but I'll make it, I guess. I've been singing the gospel songs, you know, in churches around for a while. looking forward to the night and it looks like we're getting a pretty good crowd in out there. This next guest, uh, I've known him for years, I can, a uh, long time ago, I'm not going to say when Cecil, but he, he used to record for Sarge Records, but uh, Cecil had some songs, Dying Back and, and uh, a bunch of other songs, actually I bought a CD not too long ago that had Cecil Moore on it and uh, I've kind of worn it out. But uh, he lives in Belmont, Texas now, which is, he had a long drive into Gonzales. But would you make welcome Mr. Cecil Moore. that Hank Williams had, but he didn't follow through. I can't find him these days. He's, he stays out on his farm with the cows. He had a dog that went with him and it died of alcoholism. <laughs> Keep your loose seal and your peggy suit. I got a woman that knows what to do. Tell you, honey. 
uh, Gonzalez is, I've stayed here all these years. Why, why move anywhere else? Besides, there's a lot of pretty girls here too. <laughs> and uh, we have a lot of good scenery. Lots of pecans, lots of cattle, lots of good people. Lots of friends. Those two brown eyes, when they smile at me. I love Gonzales. I love Texas. So, I love country music too. Country music, to me, has more meaning than a lot of other music. A lot of down-to-earth depth to it. So I think as long as you got a heart, country music will be here. on the Louisiana Hayride for several shows there. And then the Mickey Gilly show. And did some shows with uh, Johnny Horton, people like that. And then I turned more into writing. Charlie Pride recorded several songs that I had written. The first one I wrote was called I'm Beginning to Believe My Own Lies and he recorded, went into the album of the year. I was real proud of that, you know. And uh, I think he got a Grammy on that album. And then, of course, he recorded several more after that. I never really liked to travel very much, you know. In that business, you know how that is. Hurry here, hurry there, be here, be there, rush, run, run, wait. So I kind of like the writing part of it. You could go to the river, go fishing, get in a boat, go fishing, write a song. I was born. One storm in Monday And that old shack On that hilltop They had no bed For me to sleep in So they made me They wanted me to become a preacher, but I didn't think I was all that strong. But I sometimes do a little preaching between. This is not recommended by me to anyone, unless uh, you have big connections with uh, radio stations and disc jockeys, because you have a lot of run-ins with uh, back in the days of the old payola, you know. I have gone in to disc jockeys and left them a copy of my record. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to it. As I walked out the door, I heard crash, crack, bang, and went my record. This is my homemade disc jockey mailing list. All these are stations. The, the, the radio is what puts the words in the mouth of the buyer. I want that record. There are so many 
good musicians are that people don't even know about. But it's really a shame that so much of it's just it's breaks because you see a lot of fantastic musicians in this world just didn't get out. And sometimes it's not their fault. Maybe sometimes they just didn't have that to stick with it. In fact, on this anthology that just came out, I mean, most of the uh, songs on there I've not heard are the groups, and I've been playing through them, and you think, gee, you know, if some of these songs were even recorded uh, today or, or even back then, and the, and the disc jockeys would have really played them. It's amazing what some of those songs might could have done. Because they're really good songs, and you never even heard of them. If you mention anything about going to Nashville, you know, I think I go to Nashville, I'm going to go up there and do some recording or something. Ah, that's all y'all all talk about is Nashville, you know, you'd say. He wanted you to stay with Sarge, with his record company, and I don't blame him for that. But I, I thought he should have done more like Sun Records did, you know, try to get the artist they had on the label a deal on a major label but he didn't seem to care for them too much. I think sometimes it's only, maybe you don't quite have the incentive that you need to go all the way, and maybe, uh, because it takes everything you have, it takes all your time, and it takes uh, away from other people you love, and it's the worst thing in the world for marriage and that kind of thing, and I think maybe some of the folks just thought it wasn't worth it. But they had the talent, and Charlie had the talent to see talent. It's not easy independent record company is not easy because you know you got a lot of big companies gonna that got the funds to do it with and they don't want to see you go in there and be number one to do well in music i don't care if it's country rock or what you're in you have to have money in back of you you have to actually be with a, a major label but so many people that are green the recording business will go to a, a label, a small one, and think they're going to hang the moon. And uh, this is not true. There's a, a lots of money in the music business today. And also, when you got a lot of money involved in something like that, there's a lots of politics. So the, the competition is real, pretty rough, really tough. But that's what it's all about. It makes you feel better when you beat the competition. <laughs> Distribution is the lifeline of your records. If you don't get distribution, you'll be donating your, your money and time into something that doesn't sell because you, you have to get these manufactured and then you have to prevail upon the disc jockeys to play it so somebody will come in the store and ask for it or go to a jukebox and play it on it. So uh, it isn't uh, much easier as it's cracked up to be. If a record catches on locally, uh, they say it's developed legs, which means it's learning to stand, it's becoming able to stand on its own and make waves in the, in the listening audience. <coughs> and as um, it begins to catch on, it spreads outward and gains an ever larger audience. And eventually, it's going to start making surveys, uh, radio station uh, top 40, what have you. When that happens, the larger labels are going to notice, and they're going to see that it's it's on a small label, and they're going to contact the record producer and say, why don't you let us take this, and we will market it nationally and distribute it nationally on our label, and we'll pay you part of the proceeds. So that's how that works. His idea was uh, to uh, mail out a few records here. We'll wait a while to mail a few more records. We'll mail out a few more records. My view on that was this. I, see, I don't see how you can get a number one record by mailing out a few records at one time and wait and mail a few more records. If you don't do it fast and furious when that record is out there, it ain't gonna last, it's gone. When you send out 78 RPMs in the mail, that postage uh -huh, was pretty heavy, see? So I'd send all over the country. I'd send, I sent A. Cuff Rose 50 copies because they were my publisher at the time. You need to put out the amount of records, the amount of songs and singers that you can afford to promote. Some of these guys, uh, they'll record a record for you, you'll mail it out, and in 30 days they're knocking on your door. Where's my royalty? Why don't you get up there and follow that record up? Go out and see these people. 
Like I told Why don't you, you put some more money into my records and put another one out on me. <laughs> like I told you a while ago, that I have walked in a lot of radio stations, left the record as I was walking out. I heard <laughs> waste plastic. I more or less got out of the music business because of because of things that happened. And I'll tell you that, that uh, I never got one nickel royalty from Charlie Fish in all the stuff that we did. He sold he sold the flip side of I suppose, which was called "You Ain't Fooling Me," in Europe for years. But I never I never got a writer's royalty. I never got an artist's royalty. I never got a nickel from it. You had your fun, but you ain't fooling me. I'm sure there was a disgruntlement uh, from the people that maybe thought they didn't get the play they thought. But of course, you're small fish in the pond, you know, you do what you have to, so that's uh, that's what he did. And I think he did, for the most part, probably uh, as good as anybody. I feel sure that he handled everybody probably the same way that, that he did us, and uh, I, I certainly have no criticism of that. It was a kind of a subtle souring of, of my view of the, the music industry as I saw it at the time. I didn't see myself going anywhere, but I did see time slipping away. Uh, and I finally concluded that, that there really was no future for me in that business. And I said, well, time to abandon ship. I used to go up there, I told him, Charlie, I said, I guess what I need to do if I'm going to get any royalties is I'll get in your icebox and drink up all your beer. <laughs> we made money on every record that we put out. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not talking about a, a big amount, but uh, we, we sold to uh, jukebox dealers, uh, record shops. We sold them at, at our dance jobs, and uh, it, it worked out real well all, all the way around for us. The first thing I would have done would have not taken a deal with, with Charlie Fish. Passed on that. I believe a different opportunity would have come along shortly after that if I hadn't done that. I did my own recording sessions, my own producing, uh, <coughs> paying my own uh, uh, assignment, and, uh, but I never could pay to the disc jockeys to get it to play. And what does, if you can get a radio stations to play it, then you get your, your come back to your uh, uh, royalties report through, say, BMI sends you a check, but this song was reported so many plays, but if these people don't report them or play it, you won't get that. I don't guess I'd be really mad at him. And uh, I said, but you know, I would have liked to see him some invoices or something on how many records am I selling, you know. I don't care if they're 10 records or 10 million or whatever, you know, I'd like to see something. And so I just never did pursue it any further. I figured, well, like I said a while ago, I thought he maybe he had other problems. Everybody's got problems. Each night the clouds take away the moon. And each day the same clouds take away the sun I'm sad and blue and so lost without your love And I realize the storm has just begun If I were smart I'd realize my heart was just a toy you used to have your fun But now I know As teardrops start to flow I realize the storm had just begun Every decade was, was good. This place, that was maybe not easy, but good. You were booking Eddie Arnold and Johnny and Jack and Webb Pierce and Farrell and Young and all those people. And, and you had it jukeboxes all over the country and you were making these records they they all had to be good years 
which started yeah. in the yeah. 50s and went on through the 60s, the 70s. This time has just begun. Gnu is, is Gnu. Enough is enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a good deal there. Eh? Apartment in the back to live in. A storehouse. Uh, then a workshop. Then a record shop. I had lots of girlfriends. I had money too. I had lots of good fun. That won't ever do. No, 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 baby. I'm telling you true. Just want you, baby. Baby, just want you. For more information about this program, visit ITVS online at ITVS.org. Lots of sweet dreams, dreaming about you. I've had lots of good dreams, but that won't ever do. No, 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 baby, I'm telling you true. Just want you, baby, baby, just want you. Just want you, baby, baby, just want you. Just want you, baby, baby, just want you. Just want you, baby, baby, just want you.